Ladies and gentlemen, I am Tosh Berman, and this is Tosh Talks. And today, I'm going to talk about someone who I really don't care about that much. This is the first episode where I'm going to focus on somebody I could care less about. He was America's number one best-selling poet in the 60s and 70s, so millions of copies of his book. He also made records, spoken word records, as well as records that he sang, sold millions of those. And this gentleman is the name Rod McKeown. Why am I talking about Rod McKeown when I really don't care about Rod McKeown that much? Well, sometimes it's very interesting what one likes and one doesn't like. And I thought when I was, when I first, you know, this morning when I woke up to show the thing I'm going to do a thing on Rod McEwen, I first thought, why I don't like Rod McEwen. But interestingly enough, the more you sort of do a little research, and we're, I'm talking only about an hour or two hours of researching at the very least, I found him more interesting. And it's not his work that's interesting, it's Rod McEwen that's interesting. And it's not Rod McEwen's personality, because I don't know his personality at all. I know very little about Rod McEwen. But the little bits of pieces of information I picked up on Rod McEwen, I found interesting. First of all, in my generation, um, I was very much aware of Rod McEwen in, in numerous ways. <clears throat> As a child, he was on TV a lot. He did a lot of variety shows, American variety shows. And he also had a lot of records out. Some, well, he made hit albums, but records that I associated with him was played on the radio, and I was aware of his name in an early age, as well as his look. He had a very specific look, and actually a very good-looking man. And I always liked his dress sense. He always wore Levi's, a shirt or a sweatshirt, or a sweater over the shirt. And again, why am I so obsessed with these little, simple, visual aspects of performers and writers? Is this the visual sense of a, of a personality or an artist is very important to me. And it's very surfacy and it's very not important, perhaps, in the general scheme. But for me, it's important. And and I didn't tell you the truth, I have not thought of Rod McKeown until yesterday morning, or yesterday afternoon, I went to one of my favorite record stores called Mono Records in Glendale on Colorado Boulevard. This is not a paid advertisement for them. I'm just, I just go there a lot. I really like the store. And I came upon an album by Rod McEwen, which, like Marcel Proust eating that cookie with the tea, it brought up memories. And this is the album that I purchased. Beatsville by Ron McEwen. And what this is, is basically he recorded this in 1959. And he was not a yet a major star, but he was you know, working his way up to the heights of stardom. And <clears throat> it's during the late 50s or early 50s, like say from like 58, 59, was the height of the beatnik phenomenon. Not the Beats, mind you, but the Beatniks. And the Beats, and we all know who the Beats are. I mean, it's like <clears throat> Jack Kerouac, you know, Allen Ginsberg, William Burroughs, Gregory Corso, you know, and onward and onward and onward. And you know, it was a huge um, counterculture scene of sorts at the time of the late 50, mid 50s to the late 50s, specifically. A lot of literature, mostly literature, was produced from this generation of, of, of writers and artists. And my father, who is uh, Wallace Berman, is considered at one time or and loosely associated with the beat movement or the beat generation. And as the beats start getting popular, not due to not only to their work and their novels, like On the Road by Jack Kerouac and Ginsburg's Howe, also. The Beats were kind of a threatening figure in America during the late 50s, during the McCarthy era, 
very conservative um, uh, landscape of America at the time. And, and certain media figures were making fun of the Beats. And they made fun of the Beats by calling them Beatniks. Sort of like Sputniks. Sputniks is like going out of space or Russians sending satellites around the, around the Earth. So then they decided to do Beatniks. And the Beatniks is a terminology that is very much hated by the Beats. They loathe the word Beatniks. Yet, more you hate something, more, of course, people use it. So the whole Beatnik thing started by various people. Um, Mad Magazine, which was a very much of an influential humor magazine at that time in America, had like made fun of beatniks and actually quite funny. And also um, a lot of cartoonists did their little beatnik drawings that were kind of funny. And then, and then people like Rod McEwen made this album called Beatsville. And what it was, you have the picture, okay, first of all, you have always have a picture of a beatnik in a coffee shop or at a bar that seems to only be serving wine and coffee. I guess beets or beatniks do not drink beer or cocktails or martinis. It's always red wine, never white wine. Chardonnay was not it for some reason, or coffee. So there's an the image of like, you know, like Lawrence Ferenghetti, uh, uh, Jack Spicer, um, uh, Kerouac reading these coffee shop bars, you know, and reading their, their poetry. And, and then, you know, of course, you always have the image of like uh, 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 bongos played in the background, like really rapidly, or, or a stand up bass player and a sax, you know, as a music thing, which is true. It did happen. I never witnessed this, but I've heard about it as you have heard about it. So, Ron McEwen in Beatsville. made an album of that feeling, of that landscape, of that spectacle of sorts. And by the way, I think we all agree, an incredible cover. And if you notice, the women, the, 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 the model here is incredibly beautiful. And every guy who I showed this to have commented on, on her on a consistent basis. But anyway, so here is Rod McEwen reciting his poetry with the jazz background inspiration. And he's reciting like beat poetry. And it's a terrible record. Yeah, it's terrible in a very interesting way. First, when you look at it, you think it's just him making fun of the beats. Or making fun of like a humor, like a sort of a satire on the, on the beat world. And maybe in Rod McEwen's mind at the time, maybe it was a satire. Though, Ron McEwen did live in San Francisco in the 50s. He did read his poetry in coffee houses and at jazz clubs. So it's very possible that, you know, he might have read with, with Ginsburg or read with um, Kerouac, but nobody probably remembers it. <laughs> Still, Ron McEwen is not a thenic beat. A beatnik, perhaps. Yes, he may be a beatnik. So, you know, I lived, as a child, I lived in San Francisco at North Beach at that time, and I have a memory. I, I remember that period quite lividly, and I wrote about it in my new memoir, Tosh, coming out next year. Rob McEwen's not mentioned in the book at all, this, this exclusively on Tosh Talks. And what struck me of, of interest about, um, so anyway, I, I bought this album, it cost $33. So it's a very rare album. Why I pay $33 this album? Because in a way, it, when I saw the cover, it reminded me of my past. It reminded me of my, my relationship with my parents at the time in, 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 in San Francisco. Even though it's a false memory. I mean, my memory is real, but this record is totally false. It's a fake, it's a fake, it's a fake, it's everything's fake about it. So it's, it's interesting to have something totally fake to remind me of something that was actually real. And that's how like popular media works. That's how like pop songs work or, or, or great literature. It reflects, it reflects, makes the reader or viewer to reflect on something, something personal, but something, but we're getting the original information from is totally fake, 
false Hollywood movie. It's like a fake narrative, but you're drawn into the story for some reason. So I listened to this album at least two or three times already. Not a good album, by the way. I already mentioned that already. And I tried to listen to Ron McKeown away from the beatnik thing. And poetry st the poetry is still terrible. But what's interesting, though, I do see I do see him like making comments on the beat scene. It's almost like a humorous. It's all, uh, there, there's a sense of humor being played in, uh, on these, in this recording. And it's not him, it's him. He's the place as an observer. And sometimes he's one of the characters in his little poetry or his narrations. But maybe a listener in 1959 will think, wow, this is a real testimony from a real beatnik in San Francisco, you know, see what he sees. And that may be the case, in a sense. But it, it's, it's interesting that uh, McCune distances himself from the narration, in a way, as he recites his, his poems, his poetry. And interestingly enough, uh, Ron McCune, who I don't know that much about, um, well, in the record, he talks about these experiences as a straight man, a straight beatnik poet. And the only time he brings up the issues of um, homosexuality or, or gayness or is basically a couple of times he mentions lesbians. He mentions one girl with ACDC, meaning bisexual, and another joke about seeing two cops making out, two female cops making out. And it's, and it's interesting enough because as far as we know, Ron McEwen is gay and, or bisexual. He himself never, he has issued it, it publicly, but never commit himself to I mean, being gay, straight, bisexual, whatever. He doesn't believe in that type of categories at all, which is which perfectly fine. But, and he also has contributed and during his life of uh, 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 gay and lesbian causes and political causes. So he never came out of the closet or came out publicly, but yet publicly he has worked and dealt with um, gay and lesbian issues publicly. Anyway, <clears throat> the second thing interesting about Ron McEwen to me is that in the 60s, he's the first person in the English speaking world who brought to attention the world of Jacques Borel. And um, Mort Schulman, who's a, who's a great songwriter, a real building songwriter, also went to France and translated Borel's work into English. That's like another story, another, narr another narrative, and I want to give him credit as well. But for the big, you know, the big hit songs, the big sort of big American acceptance, it was definitely through um, Ron McEwen. And Rod McEwen was a friend of Jacques Brel. He actually met him in uh, France and hung out with him and worked with him. And I, could, and I think in a way he was very much of a formal, um, the guy who translated uh, Brel's lyrics into English. And I think Brel accepted that. In the 60s, or early 70s, this came out. It's, it's Rod McEwen sings Jacques Brel. McCune is also a singer, which I shouldn't have noted, besides this reading poetry. And um, what's interesting about this album, one, I like it. <laughs> I like him singing Jacques Brel, and I like Ron McCune's voice, which is kind of rough. It sounds like he smokes way too many cigarettes. And he's very harsh, and uh, I mean harsh. And um, he sort of reminds me a little bit like late day Serge Gainsborough, in a sense. Um, but Ron McKeown's kind of a wholesome image of sorts. I mean, Ron McKeown has a wholesome image. But um, him and Braille were very close. And he did, a lot of, he did a lot of the actual translations. And this is kind of interesting because more likely Scott Walker, who did a lot of Jacques Bell recordings, I'm sure half of the songs were probably, well, Schumann, but probably a lot of it was probably translated by um, Ron McKeown. So, that's interesting to me. That if there's like, like sort of like Scott Walker, as you know, if you watch Tosh Talks on a regular basis, as you should, you know I love Scott Walker. 
The other person I love, as you should know, is David Bowie. Now, we all know that David Bowie has a strong Jacques Brel fixation as well. And he, Bowie recorded Amsterdam, which, if I'm not mistaken, and I can't be mistaken, I think that uh, Bowie's version is, this, is the version that um, Rob McKeown translates the English, I mean, from fr French to English. So there's that connection. Now there's like a David Bowie and Rod McEwen connection. I, I love those connections. I find it really exciting. But I swear to God, there's a true story. I'm going to tell you now. I used to work at a bookstore. And Rod McEwen came in. And I recognized him right away because he's that, he, he totally has the Rod McEwen look when you see him. The sweater, the, the shirt. Very handsome man. This time he's an older man, but very, very kind of rugged, but handsome, you know, and there, there's definitely a, a sexy vibe about him. And he was looking for books, and he looked like you don't want to talk to him because he looks totally focused on shopping for books or in his own world. Ten minutes later, David Bowie comes in. And immediately, I'm thinking, Jacques Burrell. And I see them walking. They're walking in a room, like they're in the same room. They're sort of like changing places, and, but they're not acknowledging each other or they didn't recognize each other. And, uh, I mean, of course, Bowie's way more famous, I think, than, than um, Rod McEwen. But McEwen did not show any attention to him. And I thought, well, how strange. There's these two guys here whose lives have been changed because of Jacques Burrell. And I thought, well, this is too much. I was, like, I was like freaking out behind the counter. I was going, I have to introduce them to each other. I just wanted to go up there and say, David, David, have you met uh, Rod? And you know, they, you have um, a Jacques Brel connection. You know, chat, or maybe you'll make a record together in the future, or something like that. It didn't happen because one, I don't know David Bowie, and I don't know Rod McEwen. So for me to come up with total strangers, the both of them, to introduce them is totally, in my mind, rude. And maybe a proper thing for a bookseller to do because a bookseller is supposed to bring attention to literature and stuff. Why not the fact that these two individuals start their career, or the big height of their careers was Jacques Burrell. And I, and, I, and I was frozen. I really wanted to introduce these two and together. And I didn't do it. I couldn't do it. It was a moment that passed. And I, I regret very little in my life. But I regret that I had not tried to introduce Ron McEwen to David Bowie. That's it. So that's, 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 the, that's all the whole story about Jacques Brel, Bowie, and stuff. So, you know, again, Rod McCune's not that interesting to me. Except, you know, as I did some research, um, I found out that, you know, Rod McCune bought a house in Beverly Hills, like a mansion. You know, he's a million, million, millionaire, zillionaire. And he bought this huge mansion. And apparently, um, Rod McCune and his friends was John Lennon. I'm sure John Lennon has a lot of friends. But what I find really interesting, when John Lennon uh, and Yoko Ono split up, John Lennon moved to Los Angeles and sort of had his, rumor has it, or the legend is that he had this crazy alcoholic drug lost weekend, which was like last for like three years, with his friends Harry Nilsson. I think Ringo's part of that, and you know, so on and so on. Well, John Lennon lived at Ron McEwen's home in Beverly Hills. And that I found really interesting. The other thing I found interesting is that Rod McEwen was a very close friend to Charles Schultz, the creator of Peanuts. And Rod McEwen is a comic book collector as well as a comic art collector. And he also had a lot of original, like Charles Schultz, Peanuts drawings and stuff like that. I found that really interesting. And then going back to the Beat, you know, the Beatsville era, uh, Rod McEwen wrote songs in the 50s like for record labels and stuff, and he actually wrote, a, he wrote the song and he recorded it with Mike McFadden, I mean, excuse me, Bob McFadden, and Bob McFadden was a, a, a voice actor, did a lot of cartoon characters, stuff like that, or commercials, voiceovers. So Bob McFadden was making novelty songs, and he made a song called The Mummy that was co-written or written by Rob McEwen, and then the B-side. The B-side is a song called The Beat Generation that Rod McEwen wrote. And that song, Beat Generation, 
got, many, many years later, it got reworked by Richard Hell, and it became the blank generation. It's basically the same melody, same song, except, except not mentioning the blank generation, not saying <laughs> the beat generation, it's the blank generation. Richard Hell's version, by the way, is brilliant. Um, again, Ron McEwen's and Bob McFadden is like so-so. But that's kind of important. In a way, Ron McEwen has affected culture in, or my life in many ways that I, didn't even know, I wasn't even aware of. I thought it was fascinating. Also, I lost like the idea that, that, the, 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 it was like the, that it was Bob McFadden and Dor, D-O-R. Who is Dor? Who's D-O-R? And then I realized, well, I read that Dor, D-O-R, is actually Rod spelled backwards. And I thought that was kind of fascinating. So Bob McFadden and Dor, where Dor is actually Rod, because it's spelled backwards, Dor. And then what really intrigued me about Rod McEwen is he has a large record collection. He had 100,000 CDs and a half a million vinyl LPs. And you know, in my daydreams, I want to have my own record store in my own house, like a room that looks like a record store. And I want to have enough money so I can hire a really pretty clerk behind the, behind the desk. And she will just be there playing records for me. It's, a, it's like a fantasy. At this, after my book comes out and you know, the movie writes, stuff like that, then that reality may happen. But when I see, I looked at pictures off the internet and Ron McEwen's place is a record store downstairs. He has like a basement that looks like a record store. And I always wanted a basement that looks like a record store. And he has a half a million albums and 100,000 CDs. I have in the fog's idea what music he likes. I know there was a, after he passed away, there was an estate sale. So I have to presume they sold the records, but I was just dying to know what did he collect. I presume that he lived, you know, he lived in Beverly Hills, so he probably went to Tower Records twice a week and probably purchased everything maybe, I don't know. Or is it very collective, like did he, was he a very collector minded where he only got like first editions. But then I heard, I read a quote from somebody who knows him who said that he organizes albums by labels. So like it was like an RCA section, a Capitol Records section, you know, MCA section, DECA. And then he, you know, each record has a number, like a serial number for that label. And he actually organized the records by serial number. So very much like a library minded person, you know, like a library code. And I found that really interesting. And then the other thing I find kind of interesting is that Rob McEwen suffered from severe depression throughout his life. He was, um, he had a really rough childhood. He left when he was like 12 years old due to his family and friends of the family consistently beat him and I think, you know, sexually harassed him as well. And he left, he went on the road like a, like a hobo of sorts. So all this has like sort of a poetic history, a poetic charm, a Rimbaud. You know, it sounds like Rimbaud, like a, like a 1950s Arthur Rimbaud, except Rimbaud is a genius and Ron McEwen is not a genius. And I think it's very interesting that Ron McEwen, not being a genius, yet still has a presence on this planet from his work and from his life. I find that totally fascinating. And this is Tosh Berman. This is Tosh Talks. Thank you. <laughs>